Hello and welcome to Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind. I'm your co-host, Russ. And I'm your co-host, Mike. We're here on episode 156, Mike. Yeah, and uh, people don't know this, but we've actually recorded episodes 1 through 156 without stopping. So, you know, we kind of started at episode 1, you know, months ago, and then we had our meals brought to us, and we just haven't stood up yet. We have really long beards now. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, tonight we've got a lot of people to thank, so I want to start rolling in with that. We first want to thank Peter Garifus and Bobcat Records, both for sharing our episode on Facebook last week. That was for Peter's group called Pacillions and the recording next morning that we featured in last week's episode. If you haven't heard that one, be sure to check it out. It was really exciting. Also, thanks for sharing the episode to Laura Vanderheiden, the cellist from Path to the Moon on Yeah, Chandos. that was a great album, and it was really nice of her to share that episode. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren. Great performances and an interesting programming of the pieces there. We got a nice comment on Facebook, too, from Greg Hill. That was about Randy Napoleon's The Door is Open, the music of Greg Hill on Origin Records, or OA2. So thanks for checking out the episode, Greg. We'd really like to interview Greg sometime about his unique approach to composing. And just before we started the episode, we were talking, I noticed we got a little alert on Facebook, and our episode, Splashes of Spain, from back, when was that, January? Mm -hmm. A few months ago, anyway. Yeah. We featured Catalan Cello Works on Naxos from Laia Martin. I had Mm -hmm. tagged her back then. I guess she just noticed, so she shared the episode (laughs) on her page, too. So thanks, everyone, for sharing. We both spent time with musicians, and we know that they can... Yeah, they're busy. They're they're busy, but they're not necessarily looking at their phones all the time, which makes them kind of nice to be around, really. Also, a heads up, next week, we're going to actually take a week off. So any regular listeners who are looking for a weekly episode, I've got some catching up and tour guide activities to do for my best friend from my youth, a guy who... I grew up with from the fifth grade all the way on up into university, and he's visiting Japan now, and he'll be in town starting from tomorrow. I haven't seen him in about 20 years, so I won't have a lot of listening time for the next week. Speaking of Japan, as everyone knows, we're always live from the mountain lair in Japan. Mike, there's a musical connection to something very close to the mountain lair. Oh, really? Right here in Japan. Later Mm -hmm. on in this episode, so I'll mention that when we get to it later. I think I know what it is. I don't know exactly what it is, but I think I know, yeah, I think I have an idea of where we're going with this in the jazz section of the program. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. Mm. Now, all this music we're going to talk about, every week we talk about six recordings, three classical and three jazz recordings or recent releases. In the episode description, you can find links to Spotify and Apple Music for all of those releases. And at the top of the description, there's a link to the full episode playlist. That's all the music in one place on Deezer, CD quality streaming music from France. You can also listen to the podcast on Deezer as well if you want to get everything in one place. Now, when you access the podcast on different apps and you know, different sites, sometimes it's all laid out really nicely because I always look. And some apps just jumble everything together, <laughs> all the right. text and hyperlinks. It's really hard to see. So wherever you listen to us, if it's not clear or easy to see, you can always come over to our host site. That's Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com. Everything is easy to follow there. If you enjoy the podcast, please follow or subscribe wherever you listen to us. Tell a music-loving friend. Help us get some more listeners. If you take a moment to give us a ranking or write a short review, that also helps us get listed in the recommendations and we get more listeners that way. Come over, follow us on Facebook. You can see our handsome faces. Get extra info throughout the week on new releases. See interaction with different artists. And you can leave a message or comment there as well. If you have any questions or comments you want to get in touch directly, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is adultmusicpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. As we do in every episode, we want to recommend our friends AJ and Johnny over at The Same Difference, two jazz fans, one jazz standard podcast, where they have an episode that comes out every two weeks focusing on one jazz standard. They give you the history behind the song. They check out the original version and various other versions. They play little samples from that. Talk about what they like and don't like. And you get history and humor all in one nice podcast. There's a link to their podcast in the description. And if you stick around to the end of our episode, you can hear a little audio promo of what they do. We also share clips of the music while we're talking about it so you can get a better idea. And here is our fair use disclaimer. 
Music sample clips are for commentary and educational purposes. We recommend that listeners listen to the complete recordings, all of which are available on streaming services in the links provided. We also strongly suggest that if you enjoy the music, you consider purchasing the CDs or high-quality downloads to support the artists. All right. What do we got in classical tonight, Mike? Okay, just to start out, we have an album whose title I really wish I had gotten the pronunciation of before we started this <laughs> podcast. But it looks like it's an Arab word, al Bundukia, and I guess it's something like that. Okay, al Bundukia, hmm. the Lost Concerto. This is uh, by a cellist who I really like. He's very creative, Giovanni Solima, and Federico Guglielmo on the violin, and Il Pomodoro. So we've heard a lot of Il Pomodoro on this podcast. They're really kind of an exciting group, and no less so here. Hmm. They really kind of lend great support. This is on the Erato label, sometimes labeled as Warner Classics, but they're kind of the same. Warner Classics right. is the parent of Erato. This came out on March 1st. Okay, so Solima released an album last month called uh, Sweet Italien, Vivaldi, Solima, and Stravinsky, hmm. uh, which we didn't cover. It's on the Lynn Records label, and he's already back with this offering, wow. which seems to be <laughs> released slowly into various formats. It's only available as a download at the moment. So Lynn, I think Lynn is the smaller label because they're, right. I think they're independent, and they put that out on a CD, but this is the Arato label who are like Warner Classics, one of the biggest labels for classical music in the world, and there's only a download so far. So I think they might be doing some weird special mm. release for this. You can hear this on streaming, though. Not only does this uh, exist as a download only, there are no booklet notes, very little documentation that I could find online, and no track listing on Warner Classics' website. I had to go to Presto Music for that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the thing is, for example, today I wrote to a minor label that we're going to do uh, an album on, and they got me their um, booklet notes, uh, like, within hours. It was amazing. Right. It, it happened so fast. But you write to the big labels, like Warner Classics or somebody like that, and they they usually don't even answer you, yet they yeah. have a contact site. So I want to just encourage them to, uh, you know. Yeah, get with it. Come on. Answer my email. Come on. Yeah. What are you doing there? Anyway. Taking its title from the Arabic name for Venice, Al Bundukia is the Arabic mm. name from Venice. The program explores the musical connections between La Serenissima, another name for Venice, and the Eastern Mediterranean and Asia. Yes, East is going to meet West. And when I say East, I mean Near East. Okay. We're not going all the way to China. Not as far as us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. On this one. The Lost Concerto in question is a new work by Solima, the cellist, based on the orchestral viola part which is all that survives of Vivaldi's cello concerto Per Teresa, which is currently held in the Venice Conservatory. So he started it, and he just didn't finish it. The program also includes Vivaldi's double concerto Proteo, Ossia Il, Monde, Il Mondo al Rovescio, which is a pretty famous one, uh, Tartini's Adria del Tasso e Gondoliera, solo improvisations by Solima, and traditional Cypriot and Albanian music from my uh, research on the web. <laughs> No thanks to the Arata label here. <laughs> okay, anyway. The charismatic cosmopolitan cellist Giovanni Solima joins the instrumentalists of Il Pomodoro and for Al Bunduki of the Lost Concerto. Okay, I'm just reading that from their website. That's what they said. All right, All right let's go to the tracks. Now, we're going to start with something Eastern or Near Eastern. Carzalamides, number one, Moderato. Now, Carzalamides, yeah, I had to really look for this. I'm not really sure what it means. It's apparently the plural of Kartselamas, which is a Turkish folk dance all over northwest Turkey and carried to Greece by Anatolian Greek immigrants. Mm. And the term Kartselama means encounter, welcoming, or greeting in Turkish. The dance is especially popular at wedding parties and festivals, and I actually posted a video of what it looks like on our Facebook site, so you can go there and yeah, take a look. Out. This is labeled number one. So I'm wondering what the source of the composition is. It doesn't say. Is it a set of them? And, you know, where does it come from? I have no idea. Anyway, which I'm just going by the track listing here. So it's in a set, apparently, and I don't know the origin of that set. But anyway, they're pretty interesting. Let's hear a sample, first of all, of what this sounds like. This is how the album starts.
Okay, so all kinds of little um, subtle effects there and that strumming rhythm. The wonderful modal harmony puts me in mind of hot weather. Yeah, this is, um, you don't hear this in the, in the Arctic. I can tell you that. <laughs> There's something about the heat that draws that kind of sound. I'm really curious about why that is, but it's really interesting to me. The strumming sound sounds like strings playing a uh, quick pizzicato, really, while the cello plays a modal theme. It kind of sounds like strumming, but I think it's the strings playing pizzicato mm. or maybe strumming on the on the orchestral strings or whatever that is. There's some glissando effects, and it sets a lively dance mood for the album. So we're in this sort of, um, you know, s slightly exotic world for us Western people anyway. We go on to number two, track two, Solima. This is uh, the uh, cellist on the album. A piece called Mogul. And this starts with a cello brushing out light sighing tones with some brief swooping glissando. So we're far away from the world of Vivaldi at the moment. Let's hear the opening of this work too. It's called Mogul by Giovanni Solima. Okay, went for a long sample there, but this uh, melody is very spread out. Okay, so we've got this uh, atmospheric Eastern feel to this album now. We heard those Theorbo-like sounds accompanying, or perhaps it's a Baroque guitar. The cello line stays in the high end and soars and chirps like a bird. It actually sounds like a traditional piece of music in its modality. And the piece does get into some brief contemporary sounds, particularly in its use of glissandos, but mostly retains its traditional vibe. All right, so there we are. We're all set up for this first piece. This is the Vivaldi Concerto Perduto, which I want to say is completed by Salima, but it's not. It's basically composed by Salima, and it sounds more like Giovanni Salima's work <laughs> than it does Vivaldi's, although Vivaldi's fingerprints can be heard in there. So this is the centerpiece of the album right here. It tracks three through five. So the first movement, it's a three-movement work, is the fast movement of Vivaldi's uh, traditional uh, architecture, fast, slow, fast, for his uh, concerti. And this is after Vivaldi's cello concerto RV787 per Teresa, which we only have the viola line for. So we should think of this as more of a Salima composition than a Vivaldi one, though it does go into some Vivaldian energy and figuration, especially in the ensemble, not really much in the cello. When Salima solos, he brings the work into the 21st century. And I'm going to sample this from about a minute and 32, so we can hear a little of the Vivaldi influence and the more... 21st century Salima influence. Let's hear this. when we were kids, if you grew up in the 70s, you've got peanut butter in my chocolate, and oh, your chocolate's <laughs> in my peanut butter. Yeah. That's kind of what's happening here. Your Near Eastern Harmony is is in my <laughs> Vivaldian Concerto. <laughs> and it turns out that like a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> I really like it a lot. Okay, if you let your thoughts about Vivaldi go, it's actually a pretty stylish, exciting piece. Track four is an andante after Vivaldi's cello concerto again. They're all after that. This is the middle movement. And this starts with pizzicati in the accompaniment reminiscent of the middle movement of the winter sonata from the Four Seasons. If you remember that, it has that dun 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 kind of plucking sound. Hmm. The cello really doesn't appear until 50 seconds in. And again, his line has hints of Vivaldi, but a more contemporary compositional sound in its harmony. I always want to sample him in this because he's the one who's really bringing the... Uh, 
21st century to the piece. Let's uh, hear a bit of this. Okay, and at the end, as they faded out, you heard some of those pizzicati that sound like the uh, middle movement of Vivaldi's Winter Sonata. Those glissandi on the notes, those really, you never heard that in the Baroque era. There's an East European and Middle Eastern spice in the phrasing at times, and there are subtle modal sighs that jump out as near Eastern. Let me uh, try to give you a sample of that a little later on. keep going on because this phrasing is so interesting all right third movement track five allegro molto this is the ending fast movement this starts out like a fast vivaldi movement with strings building up tension through their sizzling and crescendoing the cello plays a repeated figure low in the instrument and keeps up with virtuosic figuration until about the 55 second mark when the moaning near eastern type of phrasings come in and again i find this so interesting let's hear a little bit of that to another uh, interesting section right after that. I'd say this piece hints at the cosmopolitaness of Venice that the program is aiming at. Uh, Salima's creation makes for an exciting piece, and the playing is compelling too. Now, I have to say, these kind of fusion-type things, when we hear them, they usually don't work. Yeah. But here they do. I'm, I'm, mm. I was really pretty amazed by this. It's a bit of a, a miraculous achievement by Giovanni Salima, and I recommend that you all hear it. That's tracks three through five. I would ask you to sample those three movements. All right, next we get track six, Giovanni Solima, Improvisation One. Solima does a few cello improvisations on this album, and this one starts as a perpetual motion figure. Kind of reminded me of the opening violin line of Arvo Peretz's uh, Fratres for um, violin and piano, that mm. version. But it's sequenced more into the scale he's playing, and you could say there's a Bach quality to it, too. Track seven through nine... We get to Vivaldi, Concerto for Violin, Cello, and Orchestra in F major. So now we're going to hear the violinist uh, Federico Guglielmo is now in the um, mix. This is the famous Il Proteo, Osia, Il Mondo al Rovescio, which means the world upside down. So after all this exoticism, sort of, or these combination, or this clash of cultures, we get a straight Vivaldi concerto. And I have to tell you, this comes across as really strange after what we heard, <laughs> yeah. because it's just so normal. You know, you're kind of thinking, where did this spaceship land from? Mm -hmm. Even though it's kind of like, you know, where, where did this convertible land from? I mean, it's something you see every day. This is a traditionally played concerto, and we're squarely in Vivaldi style for the first time on the album. Let me just kind of cleanse your ears here and give you a little sample of this from the time where the violin and cello both enter. Thank you. 
Yeah, very pleasant. And you get that great sprung Baroque rhythm from Il Pomodoro, propelling the work forward. Guillermo, the solo violinist, sounds really great here too, answering Salima's lines. The movement has solidly realized Valdian energy, and you can't go wrong with Il Pomodoro, of course. The second movement, which is track eight, the violin and cello intertwine in the Largo melody over light accompaniment, so light one can hear the continuo in the harpsichord clearly. The movement comes across sweetly, if not as gently as I've heard it elsewhere. And track nine is the third final fast movement, Allegro. Strong accents mark the rhythm from Il Pomodoro here, and the violin starts off skittering across the strings, and the heavier cello remarkably responds with similar lightness. Yeah, in fact, Salima's uh, cello playing on this album is going to be pretty remarkable at times, and really throughout. Track 10, Solima, plays a traditional tune, Moj e Bukura More, which I think is an Arabic word too. This is arranged by him. It's a traditional tune. It starts with a heavy downbeat with dramatic trills in the accompaniment and a cello line with modal melody and pizzicato and glissando effects. The tone is laid on thickly and comes across as heavy. It makes a strong impression and it really is a real departure from the concerto we just heard. At the first movement, we hear more of a love theme with some glissando swoops in the cello. The piece is now light and gentle and in an Eastern mode. At the 2 minute and 45 second mark, a new theme starts with a 1-2 bass line and bass note and chord. It speeds up as in an East European dance. The romantic melody comes back, followed by the slowly accelerando dance figure. This reaches a high speed to bring the track to an exciting close, and I would like to play that close for you. Let's just hear the last 30 to 45 seconds of this piece. So, track 11, Tartini, another Italian composer from the Baroque era. This is from his 26 violin sonatas. 26 violin wow. sonatas. Oh. He's busy. Usually people write three violin sonatas, but he wrote 26. This is number 12 in G major, B, G2 on the catalog for him. Aria del Tasso e Gondoliera. Lieto ti prende e poi. Transcribed by Salima for cello and orchestra. This sounds like a violin and is actually a cello played in its high end. It's very austere for a work by Tartini. He usually does like these really virtuosic works as well, like Vivaldi, but in his style. His music tends to be virtuosic. It unfolds like a meditation and evokes a bit of the Eastern influence the program is designed around. So this is pretty uh, interesting. Let's hear a little bit of this. And that solo line just goes on. Track 12. We get back to that uh, Turkish slash Greek dance that we heard at the beginning. Karzalamides, number three in this mysterious collection that I don't know much about. And Allegro. It starts with a violin. I'm guessing it's Guillermo. There's occasional percussion in this dance, too. It takes off as a fast dance after the first minute and leads to an emphatically played ending. And then we get track 13, Solima's Improvisation 4. Modal and spare, like a meditation, it sounds like a companion to the Tartini piece we just heard, and is very brief. Tracks 14 through 16, Vivaldi, Concerto for Violin and Cello, in B-flat minor, RV 547. The first movement, track 14, Allegro, has a slight edge to the opening chords, and I'm noticing that Il Pomodoro is a Baroque ensemble on the larger side of average here. Let's hear the opening of this concerto. <laughs>
I just wanted to sample like uh, the orchestra there. The violin and cello do come in, but the pomodoro get a big layered sound with a lot of bite to it. The violin solos first, the cello generally stays in its low range, and the interplay between Guglielmo and Solima is exquisite. Track 15, movement 2, the violin starts in its low range, and the cello enters there too. I love the light way El Pomodoro characterized the accompaniment with a harpsichord and the orbo, or some other plucked instrument in there. Let's uh, hear a little bit of that as well. Yeah, even those like the accompanying like plucked string instruments is just really fantastic. It adds a lot of character. Track 16, Allegro Molto. This is the fast final movement. Just the right amount of aggression in Il Pomodoro's staccato lines. And the cello shows some athleticism in this movement, as does the violin. But we've heard a lot of that in Vivaldi. This is a 6-8 movement. It's lively. And the cello really sparkles in this. I'll give you an example of the cello sparkling later on another track, but it'll, it'll be similar to this. Track 17 is a Carzalamides number 2, Moderato. So, so far we've heard 1, 2, and 3. The cello starts this with a whisper and includes some light moaning slides and a bit of light brush strokes, I should say bow strokes, edging on harmonics. The violin is included in this dance and engages in the same moaning sort of phrasing. There's a second festive section after the one minute mark with wavering pitches and high spirits. Percussion enters towards the end, and I'm going to give you a, an example of the entire uh, thing right up to the end. Here we go. Exciting. You get that nice uh, sort of fading note at the end, too. Next, tracks 18 through 20. Vivaldi, this is the overture from his opera Dorilla in Tempe. Now, if you've never heard of that, I think it was just rediscovered within the last 30 years, as were most of Vivaldi's um, operas. And before the 1990s, he was just mostly a man of uh, the Four Seasons and a few other violin concertos and a few mandolin and cello concertos, too. Now, the tempi, or tempe, that Dorila is in, I'm guessing, is the one in Greece and not the one in Arizona, given the time of composition. <laughs> anyway, track 18, the first movement. This was a nice segue from the previous dance. It moves at the same rushing speed as the ending we just heard. It's an overture and doesn't feature solo instruments, so it's a showcase for Il Pomodoro. The Andante, track 19, has a nice melodic feel, and I would like to sample that. if we uh, all noticed the shift to the minor like right yeah. after we heard the first line a really nice effect track 20 movement 3 allegro you'll recognize the opening from this which is recycled from the famous first movement of the spring concerto in the four seasons dun, 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 dun. it's just right here in the overture <laughs> it's very short here the four seasons version is a lot longer track 21 solima improvisation there's a cello improvisation that cries out in the wilderness it's got the heavy, powerful tone for it and sounds full of passionate feeling. It's also modal in harmony. Track 22, Vivaldi Violin Concerto in D Major, Grosso Mogul. This is only the second movement, and it's an unusual movement for a Vivaldi Concerto. It features Guglielmo, 
on the solo violin, and instead of the bright, springy rhythms we associate with Vivaldi, it has a lot of winding, heavy, moaning lines. I would have liked to have heard the whole concerto, because I'm curious about it now, but it's inspired programming to have it here, uh, between two Salima improvisations that complement it. This is Vivaldi, keep in mind. Let's hear the opening of this. a nice little uh, swooping resolve yeah. there. Now he's adding a bit of, you know, sort of near eastern effects to this uh, line. It's not quite like that usually when it's played. Track 23, Solima Improvisation 2 has a sparse sound to it and Solima starts it quietly. It's modal of course and has a wispy sort of feel to its quick ornaments like the lines are being blown in the wind. Tracks 24 through 26, Vivaldi Concerto for Violin and Viola da Gamba. La Maggiore, which I'm guessing, this is a cello here. I don't think he's playing the viola da gamba in this work. This is RV 546. The first movement, Allegro, track 24, has a familiar sound to it. I believe this is a cello soloing with a violin, as I heard, and not a viola da gamba, which would be a lot more difficult to play athletically, let's say, because the playing is very agile here from uh, Solima. And I wonder how a viola da gamba could accommodate such quick lines. The orchestra chirps its lighter lines. Let's hear a sample of a solo spot for cello. Now, earlier, I told you that there's some athleticism from Salima that we hear on this. Here's a good example of that. Okay, very famous uh, theme there. The second movement, Andante, track 25. The violin and cello play in octaves and carry the movement, with the orchestra simply providing harmonic support in their resolving chords. For the middle, they play more melodic material. Track 26, the third and final fast movement, has rushing figures. It's an allegro, by the way. Has rushing figures with strong accents in the ensemble. The violin gets the first quick lines, but the cello impresses with its athleticism given its heavier tone, which is kept surprisingly light here. Vivaldi's melodic lines are always appealing, and I'm getting a sense of how amazing his imagination was after hearing all of these great themes on a single album. Now, I want to say something about that. One of the reasons I'm getting that is because there's a lot of contrast around him from the more Near Eastern things, and we, we're hearing like the variety of um, lines and appealing lines that Vivaldi's able to come up with. A lot of times when you hear an album of all Vivaldi concertos, like there are six of them, there's short movements, and the whole meta kind of fast, slow, fast, short movement quality of it kind of makes them all fade sort of together when you listen to them one after the other, and you're not really noticing the details in the solo lines as much. So if you hear it like this, it really sort of draws you in, or draws me in, anyway, to the quality of Vivaldi's melodic writing and his athletic figuration as well. Track 27, Giovanni Solima, When We Were Trees, The Family Tree. This is his composition. I have no idea what the inspiration or background for this piece is. It's got a Baroque propulsive energy to it, but the harmonies are more advanced than those of the Baroque era. It moves sort of like a passacaglia with the rising bass line repeating, the cello solos at high speed over the accompaniment. The rhythm itself sounds urgent. There are some odd tones in the first minute from the cello that stand out. Lots of chromaticism and bowed glissandos. There are some slashing lines in the strings that sound pretty deranged over the aggressive rhythm. I'm going to sample this right up to the end, just 30 seconds before the end.
actual thought of that. <laughs> but um, your ears have been prepared for it if you listen to the entire recording. So by the time we get to this point, it doesn't really right. you know, throw us off. Track 28 is the final track, Giovanni Solima, Improvisation 3. It's brief. Solima plays haunting harmonics and bounces the bow off the strings for some interesting sounds. This improvisation is timbral in nature. And he leaves us on that odd abstract note. I thought this album was really interesting, and especially at the beginning. It doesn't play as a variety of styles, as we hear with groups like Constantinople, for example. But rather, the various styles of music from Venice are melded into a kind of melting pot and made to sound of a piece, which is remarkable. I doubt this happened during Vivaldi's lifetime. I think these types of music were kind of kept separate, although they, you might have been walking around and hearing it uh, at the time in various places. As a program, the main part of the unique, exciting stuff is over by track seven, where we get into more traditional Vivaldi concertos, spiced up with some interesting interludes between concertos. I thoroughly enjoyed the whole program, but my interest started to flag after Salima's composition of the Vivaldi Concerto Perduto, which really turns out to be the highlight of the album, and it's really almost right at the beginning. That piece puts us in a spice-filled world that evoked a cosmopolitan Venice. The rest of the program moves back and forth between the two, and we don't feel we're quite in that unique place anymore. I think Salima should have built us up to the Concerto Perduto, maybe put that closer to the end, or maybe in the mid more in the middle, building up interest first and then continuing from there with the traditional dances and the like. Despite that, though, the entire album is interesting and eminently listenable, as you heard, with excellent playing all around. Salima brings Eastern spice in his interspersed improvisations and traditional dances. The playing is excellent and really interesting. I just think the programming could have been a little different to make it even more interesting. Certainly not for Vivaldi purists, but I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, centering around Vivaldi, but with all these modal excursions and dancey pieces. And his own pieces make for an interesting little transition and sort of palate cleanses, segueing into things. You get a lot of expressiveness rather than anything clinical at all. Mike, this is a recording to let your hair down to. Oh, yeah. If only we had more or anything to let If we had hair. <laughs> See, the thing yeah. is, we've let our hair down a little too many times, and now it's all gone. Yeah, it's all gone. Mm. But I, I thought that those hair letting down days were excellent. I still remember them fondly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we go on. Next, we have a pretty famous work that I actually hadn't heard in a really long time. Smetana's Mavlast, mm. or My Homeland, composed 1874 to 1879. It's six tone poems that do kind of form a set, but each of them can be played on its own at a concert right. as well. So it's one of those um, six-tone poems that really builds into one super-tone poem. So the album is by the Czech Philharmonic with uh, Semyon Bishkov as the uh, conductor. He's Russian, and he's now apparently an American citizen, so he lives in the United huh. States. This is on the Pentatone label, released on March 1st. The album celebrates both the 200th anniversary of Smetana's birth, because he's born in um, 1824. Right. And the start of 2024's Year of Czech Music, oh. which has been celebrated every 10 years since Smetana's 100th anniversary in 1924. Okay. All right. Also, coincidentally, the year that uh, Rhapsody in Blue was um, <laughs> composed or first performed. 1924, Magic Year. I have a recording of this from 40 years ago, actually, and by the Czech too. Harmonic. Me too. The only ones I have are from that long ago. All right. The booklet notes have full descriptions of what the movements are about, with times indicating when the events happen on the recording. So if you actually get the CD or you download, you can download booklets in certain places. Um, you can read all about it and really follow the action, which is very helpful, especially because you're listening to this. Um, these tone poems, they tell a story, and you really kind of need to know what that story is. And in our case, being Americans, not being Czech, we don't really know these right. traditional Czech stories, and we have to kind of do a little research on them. But the funny thing about music is you can listen to it, you can read about it, you follow it, and you kind of feel like you got a little bit of your your heart in the Czech Republic, you know? Right. You kind of know something about that culture that most people don't who aren't Czech, you know? I really like that quality about classical music especially. Anyway, the first movement, the first tone poem, <laughs> again, these are all... <laughs> given in Czech, and I don't know how Czech sounds like, really. Vyšerad, maybe? It means the high castle. This is the first movement. And here, Smetana himself left notes for all these movements, or these 
pieces. This one starts with harps, which represent uh, the bards, the ancient bards who sang the land into existence, and the nation in this case, and who would then sing about the happenings on the high castle. They sing of the glory and brilliance, tournaments and battles up to the castle's final fall and decay, and the work ends on an elegiac note, because, of course, the castles now, when you go there, are in ruins, but they mm. still survive as sort of relics of the past. The opening chords provide most of the material for the movement, so I think it, it's probably a good idea that we hear them. You can hear these lovely uh, harp sounds here. Let's give a listen to this. Okay, so Bishkov really stretching that theme out. Now, what yeah. you want to keep in mind is the first four chords. We heard them twice, and it's like four of those four mm -hmm. chord sets that make up the entire theme. But the first four chords really provide most of the material for the entire 81 minutes of this album. We're going to keep coming back to that. So the opening is suitably poetic on the harp, and I almost feel that the harp figure at the 57 second mark, which we didn't hear, is the conjuring force here. Brass come in and beautifully give flesh to the opening harp arpeggios. At the 2 minute 49 second mark, after some fanfares, we hear that theme again uh, played melodically and lightly in the strings. We hear the theme again at 3 minutes and 40 seconds in the brass, and I want to sample that one. Now, remember those first four chords. We're going to hear them. In this case, they're not plucked. They're more legato and forceful in the brass. Let's hear them. Wagnerian in the brass there, and I should have said really brass and strings, they repeat it. So how's your ear, listeners? Did you identify the theme? I hope so. Anyway, all of this, by the way, sounds like introduction. We're four minutes into the piece almost, and it still sounds like we're being introduced to it. The orchestral sound on the recording is lush, with percussion coming up vividly, along with the rest of the orchestra, and the pacing is fantastic. Although, I gotta say, it's a little slow and sort of um, monumental. At the 5 minutes and 49 second mark, there's a faster tempo to the theme in fugal form here. The march that begins at the 7 minute mark is also based on the theme, heard at 7 minutes and 41 seconds. We reach a full triumphant statement at 8 minutes and 58 seconds when the castle is in its full glory. Moments of positivity and brightness come across as highly elevated in this performance. At the 9 minutes and 23 second mark, the fall and decay of the castle begin with a sudden descending line. We hear clarinets in place of the bardic harps. They can be heard in harmony at the 10 minute and 10 second mark. By the way, the booklet notes claim that the passing theme at 10 minutes and 51 seconds sounds like Eleanor Rigby, but I can't hear that at all. <laughs> I, I didn't catch that. At 11 minutes and 45 seconds, we hear the main theme, now subdued, recalling better times. We get the boldest restatement of the theme at 13 minutes and 15 seconds, holding its head up high. And I'm going to sample that too. Let's go all the way to the end. This is about the 13 minute and 15 second mark.
Ooh, and we don't get a cadence there. We get a false yeah. cadence. Wonderful. Okay, so by now that theme is really in your head. We heard it three times, and you heard this time it's bolder and a little more stretched out. This is a two-minute denouement that we hear at the end, and it's all beautifully paced, realized dynamically by Bishkov. Okay, track two, Vltava, the Moldau. This is a very famous, um, the most famous tone poem in the entire yeah. set of six. Deservedly so, too. It's about the Moldau River, the Vltava. It starts at two tiny sources, which the beginning of the work evokes. The two streams join, and then we hear the sweep of the river through the groves and along the meadows, through the countryside where harvest festivals are being celebrated. And there's a list of more places until it passes through Prague and disappears into the distance with the majestic sweep of the Elba. The river joins the land and its people together. So I think Bishkov here evokes the originating source of the Moldau vividly. Let's hear the opening. So this is like the source of the river being evoked here. It's just these little bubbling parts. go those humble beginnings of that river are going to hmm. turn into the broad sweep of the really famous melody that we're going to hear in just a minute uh, a minute and three seconds in we hear the famous theme and of course we have to sample this this is really a good uh, way to judge the entire performance because everybody knows this theme here we go Okay, now, it's very slow, I have to say. I think uh, Bishkov is trying to evoke the the flow of the uh, river more than the melodic line, which we usually hear. I think it works okay. Bishkov makes the theme very broad, and the tempo is on the slower side, giving the theme its built-in majestic feel, while providing a bit of rhythmic bounce, too. I noticed that, that the kind of rhythmic bounce comes out a bit more in Bishkov's approach. The river's flow continues past hunting horns at 2 minutes and 52 seconds, a wedding with a polka at 3 minutes and 51 seconds, water sprites at night at 5 minutes and 51 seconds. They're characterized by intertwining woodwind lines played quietly enough that they have a haunting magical effect. There's like a gentle firefly glow to the playing there. And then we have horn fanfares that take us back to the river theme at 8 minutes and 40 seconds. All of these episodes are in such contrast that they jump out of the texture, and Bishkov provides slight retardandos to signal that they're coming. The dramatic development at 9 minutes and 32 seconds is associated with St. John's Rapids, which is a stretch, or was, a stretch of fast-flowing water on the Vltava River, which doesn't exist anymore because there's a reservoir there now, which is called the Steshovis Reservoir. So if you're thinking of retracing the movement's journey, you'll have to imagine this part. Let's play that. It's a little different than the rest. This is at the 9 minute and 30 second mark. Okay, now I'm not sure how loud this is coming up in your ears there, 
listeners, but uh, I can tell you on a stereo, if you can turn this up, the sound quality is really vivid. It just mm. sounds great. And the percussion really registers strongly, really kind of real chest cavity sort of feelings there. The fortissimi are vivid, and the percussion really explodes into the room. At 11 minutes and 32 seconds, we hear the previous movement's motive. Pay attention, it's punctuated with explosive percussion. So you, you remember those uh, four opening harp uh, chords. Oh, by the way, obviously when you hear that, that means the river is passing by that castle that was evoked in the first movement. At 12 minutes and 19 seconds, there's a decrescendo indicating the river's passing by Prague and heading to the Elba where it empties out. There are two bold cadential chords at the end. Track three, Sarka. This story comes from Bohemian tradition. According to legend, it took place sometime in the 8th century and the story first appeared in the 12th century. Sarka is a maddened girl who swears revenge on the entire male population for the infidelity of her lover, although... The infidelity part isn't mentioned in Wikipedia's summary. It's just mentioned in the <laughs> booklet note. Wikipedia indicates that Sarka is acting under orders from her leader, Vlasta, another woman. And I'll start there because we can't go further back as to why that happened. Look up the Maiden's War on Wikipedia if you want more info about this. Okay, so from afar, the arrival of Stirad, and neither notes of Wikipedia explain who he is, but he's what we need to know is that he was a leader of a band of men and his weapon bearers can be heard, and they march forth to humiliate and castigate the women. They hear the cries of Sarka, who has tied herself to a tree in order to bait them to come over. Satirad is struck by her beauty, frees her. She then hands him and his weapons bearers a potion, which makes them merry and intoxicates them. They fall asleep. We hear a bugle, which is answered from where the women are hidden in the distance, and they run up and slaughter the sleeping men. What a great movement for... Women's Month. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my offering for this month. I don't know. Maybe we'll have some women composers again. We'll see. Anyway, this starts in media res, which means that in the middle of things. So the story has already started. It's got an angry theme at the opening. It's at boiling point right from the start. And this is the angry Saka. Let's hear her. Again, those percussion really register strongly on the recording. It sounds great. We hear Satirad's march at a minute and 28 seconds. And again, I know these are really famous characters to Czech people, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing them. I'm sure I am, in fact. Anyway, at the three minutes and six seconds mark, the notes claim that the sharp chords correspond to Satirad's being struck by Sarka's beauty. There's a love song at four minutes and three seconds, and the climax is right out of Tristan and Isolde at five minutes and four seconds. This isn't really as gushing as I would expect, but that's on Smetana. The Wagnerian part, though, does really register, and let me play a little bit of that for you. go the love theme as the uh the celebration of the soldiers as they drink is heard in the boisterous theme at six minutes and seven seconds and it softens as they fall asleep at the eight minute mark you can hear low seas starting in the bassoons as the men snore there's a fanfare at eight minutes and 19 seconds as the women are called to arms and at nine minutes and 16 seconds a clarinet solo leads to the slaughter this is lively rushing music and i'm not going to deprive the women listening to this podcast of their moment in the sun. <laughs> so let's hear a sample of this.
Ah yes, it's a massacre. Despite the violence of the tone poem's events, the music comes across as exciting, uh, sort of like a battle scene in a movie. Uh, track four, you know, I'm not even going to try to say this Czech <laughs> title. <laughs> it means from Bohemia's Woods and Fields. Okay. This is a general description of the feelings which the sight of the Czech countryside conjures up for Smetana and I guess for Czech people. It starts pleasantly with separate voices fully audible on the recording and the rhythmic patterns in relief. The opening plays for over a minute and does a natural fade by a minute and 20 seconds in which a woodwind theme is heard. The theme heard at 1 minute and 44 seconds was said by Smetana to represent a naive country girl, which is a powerful symbol of the nation. It's an idyll that lasts for almost a minute, and we'll sample a little bit of this. This is the naive country girl theme. Yeah, very pastoral yeah. and idyllic. You know, I've been into the Czech countryside. It kind of sounds like that. Yeah, I bet Except, it does. unfortunately, I didn't meet any naive country girls <laughs> when I was there. <laughs> uh, they were all really sophisticated, huh? Oh, boy. Anyway, the fugue and hymn themes interact afterwards. The hymn's reappearance at around the six-minute mark is far bolder than the first time we heard it. At 6 minutes and 50 seconds, we arrive at a cadence and launch into a different mood, which the booklet describes as a Dvorakian goblin's dance, heard at the 7 minute mark and played in fragments until a variant of the hymn and this dance burst into a bacchanal at the 7 minutes and 50 second mark. The naive country girl theme, we hear again at 8 minutes and 55 seconds, combines with the bacchanal and alternates with the goblin theme. We hear the hymn tune one last time, and the opening chords end the piece. All right, the next two movements are kind of about the same topic. The first one is called Tabor. This tone poem's motif is from a 15th century Hussite war song called Ye Who Are the Warriors of God. And it's going to be a theme that comes back in the next two movements a lot. The Hussites, let me give you a little history lesson here, were a Czech proto-Protestant Christian movement that followed the teachings of the reformer Jan Hus, who um, they're named after, the Hussites. He was a part of the Bohemian Reformation, which strove for reform of the Catholic Church. It lasted more than 100 years, this uh, Reformation. Wow. Tabor is a town in Bohemia, and the Taborites were a faction with the Hussite movement. The work tells of strong will, victorious fights, constancy and endurance, and stubborn refusal to yield. It's about Hussite pride and the unbreakable nature of the Hussites. We hear an ominous bass note followed by a repeating note phrased as two eighth notes and two quarter notes. It keeps repeating like it's some ominous signal, and we don't hear the conclusion of the song's theme until the four minute mark, and we finally hear the whole tune together at five minutes and nine seconds. So this is the tune that the uh, entire movement is based on, and this is five minutes in, so we're finally hearing the entire melody here. Okay, now what you heard is only the first part of the theme, and that quiet woodwind part that came in is the middle section of it, and then there's a more boisterous mm -hmm. third section as well. It's very long. Theme two is heard at the 5 minute 50 second mark, which is where I just faded out, and the tune has a third theme that we finally hear at 6 minutes and 8 seconds, and it's bold like the A theme. At 6 minutes and 35 seconds, there's a pause and a rushing, vigorous section starts with dynamic brass bursts popping out of the texture. 
The recording is richly realized, as is the performance. Basically, this movement is a set of reorchestrations of the song's themes. We hear it again at the end. It's a boldly stated, crashy movement. Okay, now, track six, the last tone poem, is called Blanik. And uh, <laughs> when I see that word Blanik, I always think of the Manolo Blahnik's shoes that Carrie wore in Sex in the City. But this has nothing to do with that. Please, ignore <laughs> that I said that. This piece is a continuation of the preceding composition. After their defeat, the Hussites hide in Blonic Hill and wait in profound sleep for the moment when they are to come to the aid of their country. So you could think of them as sort of like King Arthur, you know, who's also supposedly sleeping, waiting to wake up and save England. Anyway, Blonic uses the same motives as in Tabor as the foundation for the structure, i.e. a folk song. On the basis of this melody, the resurrection of the Czech nation, its future happiness and glory develops. A victorious march concludes the whole cycle, and there's also an intermezzo in the work in which a shepherd boy rejoices and plays oboe, and the echo answers him. I hope that echo is the uh, the country girl that we heard in the other <laughs> movement. doesn't say that, though. Anyway, this starts triumphantly with the rhythm of the Ye Who Are the Warriors of God theme. There's a steady quarter note rhythm giving a sturdy feel to the material. This goes on until the 2 minutes and 34 second mark, allowing us to soak in it. At 2 minutes and 34 seconds, we get a long pastoral section beginning after a pause. It recalls the theme in the previous movement, alluding to the naive country girl. Let's hear that at 2 minutes and 34 seconds. This only alludes to her here. Yeah, so I always think idyllic when you hear those kind of yeah. melodies in this work. The Czech Philharmonic completely changes character here from the sturdier material that we heard earlier. We break out of this with rhythmic triplet lines in the sixth minute, and at seven minutes and 32 seconds, there's a march. Fanfares introduce a full orchestral statement of the march at nine minutes and 48 seconds. And at 13 minutes and 39 seconds, we hear the Hussite song, Ye Who Are the Warriors of God, combined with the opening Fischerad, the four chords that we heard at the very beginning of the work, that open the entire suite in the harp in track one. See if you could pick that out. It's not really so easy. I got it there. So my ear just goes right to the melody, though. So, hmm. Okay, so that ties the whole work together while bringing it to an end, signaled by one last hearing of the March theme. So, that's it. I have no 21st century recordings of this work, and I'm thinking I may have to go for this one. It's sumptuously recorded, with all elements of the large orchestra emerging with great clarity and power. It doesn't have quite the same amount of paprika, that the older recordings have, such as Raphael Kubelik's famous recordings with the Czech Phil in 1990 on Superfon, which is the one I had, or the early recording with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra on Mercury Living Presence from 1952. Oh, remember wow. that one? Anyway, the Czech Philharmonic have this music in their blood, and the Soviet-Russia-born American conductor Semyon Bishkov is a sympathetic interpreter. The work comes across well, in all its color, vividly highlighted by Bishkov's conducting, he's had a lot of experience with this through his Mahler symphony recordings, so he brings out a lot of really interesting detail. These tone poems are well-paced. They tend to be a little bit on the broad, slower side, and move from episode to episode with sufficient contrast from the orchestra and the score to identify them. It's a beautifully recorded modern recording 
one to go for if one won't miss all the spice in the 20th century Kubelik recordings. I'm trying to think what the recording I have is. I think it's Balalovic with oh, wow. Czech Philharmonic 1984. That's a pretty good recording, I probably heard that too. one, too, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, there's too many great themes here passionately played to review and talk about. It's constantly changing scenes that you described. It's all really exciting. Mm. I love the big brass and the clarity of the recording. Like you say, it doesn't have a kind of total spiciness to it, but it does have a warmth and smoothness and a lot of passion in the playing for this music. So it was good to hear it again. And yeah, me too. Yeah, I think That's this is a recording you can't go wrong with, and you get all the benefits of modern sonics and digital recording. It sounds really clear. The dynamic range is impressive, and if you have a you know a nice set of speakers and you can't bother the neighbors yeah. uh, too much, just uh, enjoy this at natural volume, and you'll yeah. get all that uh, wonderful dynamic contrast. Uh, that's how I listened to it, and I liked it. Yeah, one of the wonderful things about this is classical recordings in general, but there's no compression on any of these recordings, yeah. so you just get this natural breathing sound, and you can just turn it up on your stereo, and it'll just really impact, and mm. you'll keep all the warmth as well, if, you know, depending on what kind of a system you have. But uh, yeah, really fantastic. It's a great recording. Anyway, our third um, classical recording of the evening is Brahms and Busoni Violin Concertos. This is by the Italian violinist Francesca Dego, BBC Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Dalia Stasevska. And this is on the uh, Chandos label. It's an SACD, so if you buy the uh, CD, you get that extra yeah. sampling there. And this is also released on March 1st. Yeah, classical recordings tend to all be released on the same day. It's kind of funny. Anyway, the booklet notes point out that Busoni and Brahms were musical opposites, although you would never know that from hearing this particular album. Brahms rooted his music in tradition, while Busoni wanted to be seen as an innovator. Busoni's violin concerto, which I had never heard before, I've heard the piano concerto certainly, which is a monstrous work, but this one I haven't heard, and it's a lot more conservative than that piano concerto. Yeah, I thought so too. Yeah, Busoni wrote this work relatively early in his career when Brahms was still a composer he admired, so it does have some Brahmsian qualities mm. to it. This concerto owes its existence to Busoni's friendship with Henri Petri, a Dutch violinist who had studied with Joseph Joachim, who was the dedicatee of Brahms's violin concerto. Uh, it can be said that this concerto reconciles the styles of Brahms and Liszt. Um, Brahms and Liszt, well, I'm sure Liszt liked Brahms, but Brahms didn't like Liszt. Brahms didn't like most people. <laughs> he was kind of like <laughs> Chopin that way. Uh, it's in one movement made up of sections based on standard symphonic units, so it's fast, slow, fast. It's like updated Vivaldi, I guess you could say. Anyway, the first movement, Allegro Moderato. I should mention these uh, movements are all connected. They're not really movements. It's like a one-movement work that mm -hmm. has sections in it that kind of sound like a traditional three movement work the first movement allegro i shouldn't even call it the first movement let's just say allegro moderato the first section it sort of fades in in the strings and the woodwinds play an opening theme that to me has some qualities of sibelius in it listen and see what you think And there's the violin's entry. We'll get hear more of that later on. It's not a very dramatic entry. The violin enters there with a dark, mournful line and goes into something livelier, heading to the top of the violin's range after that. At a minute and 49 seconds, a quiet cadence is reached, and the violin and orchestra then play thematic material together. Dego has a lovely tone on the sweet side and an appealing vibrato. At 2 minutes and 30 seconds, the music becomes more dramatic and urgent, with the orchestra playing insistently and the violin answering sweetly, but not without force at times. There's another quiet cadence at 3 minutes and 28 seconds. Some sort of crisis emerges at 3.44, with the violin playing with great emotion. This is released by the orchestra's theme at 4.42, with a march feel. Over it, the violin maintains tone while quietly flying over the strings. Some excellent control and technique are shown here by Dego. 
At 5 minutes and 30 seconds, a happier theme comes in. This movement feels rather episodic as a whole. The percussion is quiet, but registers beautifully on the recording. There's a big fortissimo statement of the theme at around the 7 minute mark, and then a segue into the next section marked quasi andante. Here, low strings mark the beginning. This is a beautifully and subtly orchestrated section. The violin enters at the 1 minute and 30 second mark. Let's hear that entry. And that is a sweet nougaty tone. Mm. It's a long line and it ends around the three minute and 30 second mark. So that goes on for about two minutes when we hear a new double stopped phrase, smoothly played. It's a very sweet tone from the violin in this movement, showing off Dago's tone. This highly lyrical section reaches its end around the six minute mark and there's extended material leading to a sudden but subtly played chord change at six minutes and 52 seconds. The material leading to a cadence is very extended, keeping us in anticipation of the third movement. Finally, at 8 minutes and 20 seconds, we hear a resolve and a last statement of the yearning theme for this section, or movement, if you want to call it that. There's a stop at the end of this section, despite it being connected to the next, which is marked Allegro Impetuoso. This is now track 3. Busoni characterized this as a type of carnival. The violin takes off on lightly played, very fast figuration, and Dego always beautiful in tone. So let's hear just the opening of this section. The violin is put through its paces in this movement, but Dego shines throughout and always with beautiful tone. The timpani hits come up vividly on the recording. After the third minute is reached, a new theme supported by quarter note chords in the rhythm supports the violin solo. At the five minute mark, the brass play a new theme, which is very appealing. By this point, it sounds like the harmony is heading to an end. The violin picks up the orchestra's theme for a solo movement. The finale is played with some electric energy and reaches an exciting conclusion. Tracks 4 through 6 are the very famous Brahms Violin Concerto, Opus 77. This starts Allegro non troppo. The work has a very long intro, and the orchestra comes up sounding warm on the recording. I love the presence the timpani have, though they're back in accompaniment. They impact the recording, and we hear the violin's entry at about the 2 minute and 35 second mark. Let's hear just before that so we can experience this vividly played entry. The lyricism of Dego's playing comes out in this performance of a well-known work. She lingers on certain notes, making them emote before moving on. It's subtle, but tugs at the heartstrings. A good example of this is in the lightly dancing section after the 6 minute and 30 second mark, so let's just hear a bit of that.
In the 10th minute, there's some highly appealing melodic double stopping. Dago is sensitive to phrasing throughout. It's clear that she feels this piece deeply. I love the detail of the brass accompaniment at 11 minutes and 43 seconds as the violin is soloing. It's vivid and expressive. We're back in the recapitulation at around the 16 minute mark. This is a very long movement. At the 17 minute and 15 second mark, the cadenza begins. Now, this is important. Usually we hear the cadenza written by Joachim. Brahms actually didn't write a cadenza for this. He left it up to the violinist. But here we're hearing Busoni's cadenza for this work. It features constantly and quietly rumbling timpani, recalling the soft timpani hits that begin Beethoven's violin concerto. Brahms is following in Beethoven's footsteps in this concerto, even casting the work in D. In this case, it's D major. It's good to have a rarely heard cadenza, and of course this links the work to the Busoni concerto we heard before this. The movement then heads to its final cadence once the cadenza ends. Track 5, the second movement, Adagio, is started by the orchestra and is played with a much faster tempo than we usually hear. The melody loses a bit of its melting quality when played this way. At the 2 minute and 10 second mark, the violin enters with the theme, and at this speed it sounds a bit odd. It's a new way of hearing the work, and I'm always happy about that. But again, we lose a bit of the melting emotion to gain more of a sense of the overall line in the movement. Let's hear this from the violin's entry. The material that follows registers in a fresh way. It's got a bit of passion and urgency to it, and Dago pulls a lot of emotion out of her line at 4 minutes and 1 seconds with her sweet and passionate vibrato. In the fifth minute, we're back to the opening theme and section, good sensitive playing leading to a gentle, glowing final cadence. The third movement, Allegro Giocoso ma non troppo vivace, track 6 and the final track on the album, has the violin starting aggressively. Let's hear the opening. This is one of Brahms's uh, gypsy movements. You know, he right. heard a lot of um, Hungarian immigrants to Germany playing their music and um, included it in a lot of his works. Pacing is excellent, and the violin is constantly playing figuration in this movement. The movement has a kind of rondo form to it. It may be sonata rondo because it sounds more complex than a simple rondo. But Dego's brief cadenza at 5 minutes and 19 seconds, double stopped, really emotes. I like the approach. It's got a lovely wind down by the violin in the end, just before the three powerful chords by the orchestra that end the concerto. So upon hearing the Busoni concerto, one has to wonder why it isn't taken up more often. It's really not in Busoni's more harmonically dense style and falls gently on the ear. Or perhaps it's just this performance that does. The recording is full sounding and warm and Dego's playing has a slightly glowing tone throughout. The Brahms is also sensitively played, and Dago's commitment to this work is evident. She's especially good in the first movement. We get to hear her moving way of stretching out certain notes of a melody for emotional effect. I thought the middle movement was played with too fast a tempo for its emotion to register, though I enjoyed hearing a different approach. The final movement features Dago's gorgeous tone in those famous gypsy lines of Brahms's. I'd say this is a performance worth checking out at least. The Busoni is a discovery for those who haven't heard it, and the Brahms features a solid performance, vividly captured on the recording and really beautiful in certain parts. Engaging performances, both from Francesca Dego and the BBC Orchestra, her violin tone is lovely, great technique, and sense of ease in phrasing. I didn't know the Busoni either, but I was drawn into the beauty of it. 
the mm. matching of the orchestral timbres with the violin and the gentleness of the first two movements especially kind of had me hooked to it. I know the Brahms much better, a few recordings of this. It has the bigness of sound of Brahms in this performance, but I also thought especially the violin playing was sensitive and balanced. And the sonics on the recording are really great, too. Yeah, I love that tone. She's the uh, crispy cream of uh, violin tones. <laughs> Very sweet. Okay, over onto the jazz side. And Mike, tonight's theme is sax partners. Oh, nice. I like a good sax partner. They just they sound great together. We're going to have two pairs of sax partners in the recordings this week. We're going to go from, well, high to low. And starting out with a positone recording, Willie Morris, tenor saxophonist, with attentive listening. This came out March 1st, originally from St. Louis. We heard his debut in episode 129 that was called Metal Melodies. His recording was Conversation Starter, also on Positone, came out last year in August. And here he is with another release, Willie Morris on tenor sax, also like on the debut, Patrick Cornelius on alto saxophone and flute on one track, John Davis on piano, who was also on the debut, but this time we've got Boris Kozlov on bass and Rudy Royston on drums and a little extra percussion. On the debut recording, we heard Adi Meyerson and the drummer was E.J. Strickland. As always on Positone, Mark Free is the producer and Nico Tool the engineer. This was recorded February 7th, 2023 at Acoustic Recording, Brooklyn, New York, hmm. mixed and mastered at Woodland Studio, Lake Oswego, Oregon. The recording starts out with a track called Water Fountain of Youth by Willie Morris. Great title. Yeah, it's a nice title. There's a lot of interesting titles on this recording. Yeah. Roboto, rippling piano and flowing sax lines make an intro into a cymbal wash that Royston forms a beat out of, and Kozlov gets the bass pumping over with choppy chords from Davis. Let's have a listen from where the saxes come in on the melody about one minute into the tune. sounds like a 16 measure pattern around twice and there's Morris getting started on his solo. I like how he chains ideas together really well right from the start in this one. Cornelius follows and starts building contrastingly from two note interval ideas. So let's have a listen to his alto sound on this tune as well. Descending phrases starting from higher and higher. That's pretty cool. Davis has an intense and forceful piano solo next, and don't miss that. It's one of uh, many really interesting piano solos on this recording. They get back to the melody with some final phrase repeats to a held final note and some final piano ripples. 
track two, another Morris tune, Terminal Lucidity. A lovely solo piano opening here from Davis on this ballad. Morris comes in with the slow melody, Cornelius joining in on the second phrase. It's nice how the flow has pauses before it moves on. Let's hear this tune get started. Royston can be one of the busiest drummers when it's called for, but he's extra discreet on this tune. Morris solos relaxedly and with a comforting tone here, the rhythm section leaving lots of space, and Davis has an interestingly phrased short piano solo. The saxes are back for a final, shorter melody segment to end it. It's pretty and introspective. Track 3, another Morris original, The Imitation Game. Check out the ominous alternating piano chords from Davis on the intro to this one before the saxes come in on the weaving melody line. It's an A-A-B-A form with an extra measure in the final section into a piano solo from Davis. Let's check it out. Kozlov is really chugging along underneath there on the bass. Cornelius follows with the solo. It has lines that really swing and push forward, and Morris keeps the mood with developing ideas. They pick up the intro idea into the melody again, and some final vamping on those ominous chords, with Royston whipping up the excitement to some final sax lines that wrap it up. Track 4, also a Morris original, Two Worlds Unknown. Just the two saxes start this with a harmonized rubato line. The rhythm section gets it going into an 18-measure sax melody shared by the pair into a solo from Morris. The rhythm here doesn't push ahead at first under the solos, but rests on Kozlov's pulses with tasty fills from Royston. Cornelius has a solo that builds in intensity nicely here as well, and another trip through the melody has some tasty piano fills underneath from Davis. Track 5, another Willie Morris original composition, Delusion of Understanding. This tune has a unique choppy rhythmic feel under the long melody handled just by Morris as Cornelius sits out on this one. Morris gets to more meandering harmonically on this tune, and in spots it picks up drive from Kozlov's pressing walk. Davis has an exciting solo on this one that builds up over the evolving groove, so let's check out some more of his playing on this tune.
And Morris returns from there with a shorter melody segment to finish it up. Track six, we're going to get an original tune from Patrick Cornelius, Leaving Paradise. Cornelius treats us to some flute on this one. There's an eight-measure intro setting up the bossa beat with a little extra light percussion from Royston, and the 40-measure melody has charming harmonies between the flute and Morris's tenor. Let's hear the tune get going. Davis solos first with some nice two-hand synced figures near the start and rhythmic lines, and Morris has a subtle solo with a soft tone on this one. I was hoping for a flute solo, but not this time. <laughs> no, well. Track seven is an original composition from John Davis, Moving Right Along. This tune has a cool groove. After a 16-measure rhythm section intro, the melody is in an AABA form with 16-measure sections. Check out the bass and left-hand piano figure underneath and Royston's great cymbal sound. Let's hear the beginning into the B section. into a solo from Cornelius. Morris has an enthusiastic solo as well, but the start of Davis's solo on this one really caught my ear with some neat descending ideas and tremolos. So let's check that out as well. solo there and back to the melody with some extra space at the end for Royston to work around the kit before the saxes are back to finish it. Track 8, La Mesha. This is a Kenny Durham tune. You may know it from Joe Henderson's 1963 recording, Page One. John Davis gives this one a wonderful solo piano intro into the melody. Let's hear it get started.
Messiah sits this one out as well, and I thought that Morris's solo is particularly smooth and thoughtful on this tune, so let's jump back in and hear a little bit of what he plays. <laughs> Very nice, and the slowed ending to the tune is pretty as well with bowed bass from Cause Love. Track 9, another Patrick Cornelius tune. Great title here. It too, <laughs> Caribou. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. That jumped out. After a neat stop and start intro with drum breaks from Royston, the saxes are in on the boppy melody variation on rhythm changes. Let's hear it get going. soloing first there with some nice tone. Morris follows with some fun articulation on repeated notes in his lines. Davis gets a go too, and I really like the harmonic humor in the piano solo on this tune, so let's jump back in and hear a little of that. sure there. Kozlov keeps that walk going there and Royston gets some drum solo time underneath before the melody is back. And the recording ends up with Daily Minor Blues from John Davis. It's a duet with just Morris and Davis. It starts with a solo piano intro with interesting rhythms and then Morris is in on the melody. It's a 12 bar minor blues as labeled with attractive chords. We'll get the intro and one round of it in just a minute. So let's check it out. Mm-hmm. 
They both get some solo time on this one, and it's a contrasting way to close out the recording. Morris and Cornelius complement each other well. Both have their own style with a searching quality to solos that avoid cliches. The program here is interesting with mostly original compositions from Morris and two each from Cornelius and Davis, and we get an old favorite from Kenny Durham. There's a lot of stylistic variety, very modern harmony off the bat with Water Fountain of Youth, boppy rhythm changes, and bossa beats too. The grooves are interesting and evolving with the always great synchronicity of Kozlov and Royston, and I was also impressed with the ideas in Davis's piano solos, each one having something unique that caught my ear. Another great recording from Positone, and another great recording from Willie Morris. Yeah, for me, the piano playing really stood out on this album. I really thought John Davis brought a lot of moods and excellent tone and feeling to his playing. And I liked his ideas, his overall feel, and you know, he was the, he was really the star for me. Morris soloing on the sax is sensitive as well, changing from a full to breathy tone depending on what's required. And I agree, they both interacted extremely well. Mm. Royston, of course, busy throughout, always propelling the rhythm with a strong presence. He's a very busy drummer, and that's what we love about him. He's a pleasure to listen to. So I thought this album had some great playing, a lot of variety, some great track titles too. The recording itself is on the dry side, but I kind of like that in a jazz album. Mm. And I may have to pick this up. I'm kind of thinking about it. Can never have too many Positone releases in your collection. Indeed. I have quite a few now, I have to say. All right. The next recording, we're going to take it down a notch. That's from alto and tenor to tenor and barry sax with Cohesion from David Larson. He's on Barry Sax, and we've also got Daryl Yokely on Tenor Sax. This is released by Larson himself, came out March 1st as well. David Larson's the Director of Instrumental Studies at Spokane Falls Community College. He holds a PhD from Washington State University and also degrees from Pacific University, University of Oregon, and Western Oregon University. He's performed with a lot of artists, including Ken Peplowski, Francisco Torres, Dave Glenn, Ron Vincent, Bill Mays, and many others. He's released The Mulligan Chronicles in 2021. is a homage to Jerry Mulligan. Larson's previous releases also include Borrowed Time 2018, One of a Kind 2016, and Night Shift in 2016. Of this recording, he says, quote, The idea for cohesion came when I met these players while they were on tour in the Northwest. I really loved the sound they were getting and their group dynamic. After talking for a bit, I decided to bring them out as the guests for the SFCC Jazz Workshop. While they were out, we played some gigs and went into the studio to record this album. I wanted to capture some of the great vibes of this group with my new compositions. These styles were a bit foreign to me, but I love a challenge, so I leapt in with both feet. So, to go through the personnel, David Larson, baritone sax, Daryl Yokely, tenor sax, Zachary Curtis on piano, Alex Apollo on bass, Wayne Smith Jr. on drums, recording engineer Steve Gambaroni. The recording starts out with a Larson original cohesion, a medium tempo tune with harmonized legato sax lines, its 28 measure melody, the last four mirroring the opening. The harmonies have some good twists notably in the 13th measure and a minor blues impression in the 21st measure. Let's hear the warm sound of this tenor and berry combination get things going. coming right out with a ringing toned bass solo and uh, he impresses a lot on this recording we'll hear some more of his playing in a bit curtis follows the bass solo with a piano solo that has a nice touch and relaxed phrasing 
Yokely's next on a smooth but rhythmic tenor solo, but let's jump back in for a bit of Larson's Barry solo and hear what his playing is like. Barry lines there, and from there it's back to the melody with both saxes. A nice subtle start, but don't get too relaxed though. Put on your seat belt for the next tune, Down to It, also a Larson original. A fast tempo swinging tune here with a minor melody and harmonized sax lines. It's an AABA 32 measure melody with the end of the A phrases a little bit different. Larson is out of the gate soloing at high speed, so let's hear it get started into some more Barry improvisation. to fade out on a Barry Sax solo like that. But, mm. uh, anyway, Yokely's solo is exciting too on this one, so let's hear some of his playing a little bit further on. is next. It sounds like he had a couple of double espressos before this piano solo because <laughs> it's really uh, moving along. Running lines and punchy chords and Apollo has fast finger work and double stops in a great bass solo on this one too. I actually want to sample all the solos because I really liked every one on this tune. Once more around the melody with a tag ending of sax phrases and rippling piano to finish it up. Track three also a Larson original movement the movement here is a good rhythmic feel from the start with piano and bass chord hits filled out by Smith's drums for a 16 measure intro. The sax melody starts out in unison for 16 measures, then repeats and splits into harmonies. There's a new 16 measure section that gets swinging more over a switch to walking bass, then another new 16 measure section over snappy bass lines, and a final four measures of the saxes joining in on the opening chord hit idea to launch Yokely on his solo. They keep the feel change-ups under the solos for nice variety. Larson follows, and the feel and chords here inspire happy melody lines from both saxes. Apollo has another outstanding bass solo on this tune, so let's hear him play on this one. Thank you. 
a really ringing tone and interesting style there. They set up a final run through the melody sections with four measures of the intro and finish off with a matching outro to a fade out. Track four, another Larson original, Wishing Well. This tune has a unique six beat groove and syncopated bass ostinato for an eight measure rhythm section intro. The 16 measure sax melody is rhythmic and interesting into the start of a solo from Larson. Let's hear the tune get going. Yokely follows Larson, and then both saxes and then bass and ringing drum tones work out for a bit before Curtis gets some piano improvisations with sax backing lines working up to forceful piano chords and a slowed ending with a surprise final chord. Track 5, also by Larson Fedchuk. It's a swinging minor tune. The sax melody is 32 measures and A, B, A, B with some differences like triplet lines in the second half. The A sections have a stop time feel and the Bs chug along with walking bass. There's an extra two measure tag at the end into Larson's meaty berry solo. Let's hear this one get started as well. Larson's solo has a lot of good melodic development here, and Curtis follows on piano. We haven't sampled one of his solos yet, so let's hear what he plays on this tune. bluesy touches and rhythmic feel in the piano solo there. Back to the melody with the saxes from that point to finish it up. Track 6 is the final Larson tune working things out. An even beat tune with a descending bass line idea with piano on the 8 measure intro. Yokely comes in with the first melody section that repeats with a lower berry line added. There are two more 8 measure sections where the melody continues to develop and the saxes hang over on the last note into the solo section start for Larson. There's a lot of great rhythmic bass work underneath everything in this tune from Apollo. Yokely and Curtis have solos as well before another time through the melody and some final gentle improvised sax lines to the slowed ending. Track 7 is a tune from Daryl Yokely, Mount Fuji. 
This is an exciting, speedy modal composition. The saxes take the first trip around the 16 measure melody in unison, and then Larson drops down an octave for the repeat. Let's hear it get going. I like that change up from snappy bass figures to walking bass. Larson shows some agility on the big sax here in his solo, and Curtis has an exciting piano solo on this one as well. Cool speedy ascending ideas in there. They wrap it up with a couple more runs through the melody and some final sax figures. And the final track is also a Yokely original, El Duelo. This has a long and fast melody that keeps developing before returning to the first section idea. Let's check it out into the start of a solo from Apollo on the bass. Curtis follows picking up on that Spanish tinge implied in the harmonies here with another charged piano solo. And let's hear one final solo from Larson on this tune. Curtis is really feeding him with some punchy chords there on the piano. And Yokely gets the final solo before they get back to the melody, with Curtis still punching out the piano chords to the end. I found this to be an exciting album. Larson and Yokely convey enthusiasm through all their solos that have a lot of great melodic ideas, no matter how fast the tempos are. The tenor and Barry make a powerful sound on the melodies, and they vary the harmonization on the tunes nicely. Their original compositions have a good variety of rhythmic feels and constructions, Harmonic twists also that make for interesting improvisation choices. The rhythm section is tight with creative solos from Curtis too, and Apollo's bass solos are impressive. My ear kept being drawn to what he's doing underneath throughout the recording. Yeah, the blend of tenor and baritone saxes on this album was fantastic. It's the first thing you hear, and only 
seconds in, I knew this was going to be an enjoyable album. I mean, I noticed that all the melodic instruments had a gift for coming up with thematic hooks mm. in their solos too, especially in more like pop melody tunes like Movement. The record starts quietly but takes off after the first track and keeps to mid to fast tempos for the rest of the tracks, ending with an aggressive approach on El Duelo. There's a bit of a Spanish feel in there too that kind of yeah. suits the title. All of the instruments have a good tone, and I love the tenor and baritone sax sound, both in solos and combined. It's like one of our favorite things on this podcast. Exactly. Yeah. Here, the piano and bass came across with unique sounds of their own, and the bass was especially interesting in solos. It's a solid album that builds in intensity, more or less, as it goes. Check it out. Yeah. All right, one more sax recording. Not a pair on this one, just one, but that's more than enough on this album. The Illusion of Choice on Criss Cross Records from Michael Thomas. Thomas has been an active member on the New York City jazz scene since coming in 2011. He's got degrees from the University of Miami, New England Conservatory, and the Juilliard School. He's performed with Brad Meldau, Daphnis Prieto, Nicholas Payton, Miguel Zinon, and Jason Palmer, among others. He can be heard on more than 30 recordings, and since 2015, he's co-led the Terraza Big Band, and the ensemble's Grammy-nominated debut, One Day Wonder, which was released in 2019 on Outside in Music. He's got a two-CD live album, Event Horizon, came out in May 2020 on Giant Step Arts, and his follow-up studio recording, Natural Habitat, was released in March 2021 on Sunnyside Records, which we discussed all the way back in Episode 12, Our String Thing. Wow, I didn't even remember that. <laughs> yeah. And since September 2018, Michael has been a faculty member at the University of Hartford's Hart School of Music as an artist teacher of jazz saxophone in the Jackie McLean Jazz Studies Institute. He says of this album, quote, This was a dream band to write for and play with. These musicians can play any style and sound like it's the only thing they play. I wanted to explore these different areas and cohere them into an album, not sound like tunes stuck together for a CD. Everything was on the table. I wasn't afraid to develop whatever ideas I came up with and see where they went. And the musicians he's talking about here is a special group assembled for this recording. Michael Thomas Alto Sax, Manuel Valera on piano. We've heard him several times on the podcast with his own releases. Matt Brewer on bass and Obed Calvert on drums. This was recorded in September 2023 in Astoria, New York. Engineer Mike Marciano recording, editing, mixing, and mastering. Now, I gotta tell you, Michael Thomas writes really challenging songs. I'm sure they're really hard to play, and they're quite hard to figure out and put into words, too. So this is a really challenging uh, album But to they're explain. not hard to listen to. If no, you just no, not at all. Back. They sound great. And okay. I'll get around to a conclusion of that at the end. It starts yeah. out with Circles, a Thomas original. Calvert kicks it in with the drums, and then you need to figure out what's going on <laughs> in the mm -hmm. rhythm. It seems to be alternating measures of five and four beats for an eight-measure rhythm section intro. Thomas is in on the melody. It's a 16-measure construction around twice, all over the circling sequence of chords below. Brewer is on electric bass here and works into a repeated syncopated note idea to get Thomas launched into a solo. Let's hear this get going. Thomas has weaving lines and edgy tone. Let's jump back in and hear some more of his playing on this tune.
must be something. From there is this new composed melody section you hear getting started in unison on sax and piano. That leads to things quieting down for the start of a piano solo from Valera. His lines really skate over the popping groove below. The energy keeps building back to Thomas returning with one run through the melody. Bass and piano vamp around the chords while Calvert builds up tension with tight drumming and Thomas returns with a new sax line to a surprising final note. An exciting start to the recording for sure. All right, here's your Mountain Lair connection. Yeah. Track number two, another Thomas original, Hokkeshu. American listeners are saying, what's that? So, Hokkeshu is uh, Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism, kind of sect of Buddhism. I don't know if Thomas is an adherent or not, but interestingly, one part of Nichiren Buddhism, the Kempon Hokkeshu, has its head temple, Myomanji, right across the road from the mountain lair where I sit right now. So wow. I walk yeah, by that. it almost every day. And what's cool about it is they have an Indian stupa there. It's a little bit oh. different, something you don't see in Japan all the time. So any listeners who want to come to uh, Japan for a visit to the mountain lair, we'll be happy to uh, show you around and take you to our secret restaurant as well. Oh, yeah. All right, this tune has a 16-measure rhythm section intro that hangs loose with nice cymbals and fills from Calvert. Thomas is in with the melody, and listening to this several times, I'm not sure where the melody ends and his improvisations begin. Could it be 26 measures? I'm not sure. His solo makes for an interesting exploration of the harmonies. Valera is next in a similarly exploratory mood, and Thomas is back with another time through the melody and some more final improvisations to the end. Track three, another Thomas original, Information Paradox. This starts out with a piano and sax introduction. When the bass and drums come in, it feels like it's in 5-4, but then we get some shifting meters and it's hard to figure out. Let's hear it get going. Thomas's solo lines rise in waves in this one. Valera has some really smooth, connected lines in his solo. Let's hear some of his piano playing on this tune. Just like in circles, we get a cool new unison composed line for sax and piano. It really keeps you guessing as it darts in different directions. Thomas takes it to the end with more sax lines as Calvert really bubbles up the beat underneath. Track 4, another Thomas original, The Other Side. Here's another tune that I have no idea what would be notated for the meter. Valera is on Rhodes here, and the weaving, mostly eighth note melody line is in unison by Thomas and Brewer's electric bass. Sometimes they seem to be in groups of three these eighth note patterns, or two, then four. Have a listen, see if you can figure it out. Thank you. 
Thomas, fluid solo from Thomas there, as things simmer down. Brewer has a not only fluid, but I'd say buttery electric bass solo here too. Sounds like fretless. Let's hear some of the bass work on this tune. opening sax and bass line that sticks on a repeating phrase and gets a little studio reverb fade out. Indeed he does. It does, yeah. Track five, also a Thomas original, Shades of Green. This super speedy minor tune has an easier structure to figure out, and it's in 4-4 four, four time. Cymbals ring in Brewer back on acoustic bass for a fast walking bass line and piano chords for a 16 measure intro. Thomas and Valera double up the snaking melody lines with great agility. Seems to be an A-B-A-B pattern of 18 measure sections. Calvert switching up the feel to Latin during the B parts. Let's hear it get going. <laughs> the melody Thomas continues on, bursting into flames on his solo on this one, fed by huge fills from Calvert, and we should hear a little bit of that burning. Dazzles with speed and intensity in his solo as well on this one. Thomas trades some sections with furious drumming from Calvera before they attack the two sections of the melody for a final run to a dynamic ending. Track 6, Nemocene, also by Thomas. She's the Greek goddess of memory and the mother yeah. of the nine muses. This is a gentle tune, though. There's a lyrical 32 measure sax melody. Valera has arpeggiated piano figures underneath, and Calvera is working the drums with brushes. Brewer is in on acoustic bass and gets the first solo after the sax melody. It's very melodic and has a singing quality to it. So let's hear his bass playing on this tune on acoustic. Thank you. 
Thomas is next in his solo works up in intensity and reaching phrases before settling back into the melody. Track 7, Darkness and Light, also a Thomas original. The main part of this tune has a six beat feel with a drum hit on beat 5, but the opening is beguiling and syncopated beyond belief with electric bass and left hand piano figures. There's a 16 measure melody worked by piano and sax together. Let's hear this one get started. After that melody section, there's a return of a section of the intro syncopated figures into a piano solo from Valera. Another melody section transitions to Thomas's solo that has interesting phrasing in this meter here. He works into a little section of working on the syncopated intro idea with the rhythm section, and then bass and piano vamp for Calvert to work around the drums. Thomas joins in and it works into the straight groove for a final section of more subdued sax. Track 8, the title track by Thomas, The Illusion of Choice. Rubato and rippling piano cymbals and ringing bass make a dreamy setting for the opening sax lines before it gets into a steady loping 6-8 feel. Let's hear the beginning get started. After four measures of the new groove, there's a 16 measure sax melody. The rhythmic field changes up on the second half. Then there's a section of bass and left hand piano lines before Thomas is in on his solo. It works into intense upward swirls of phrases before things get quiet for a ringing acoustic bass solo from Brewer. The bass and left hand lines bring back the sax melody once again and a final end section. Track 9, the only non-original from Thomas and a jazz standard, It Could Happen to You, Jimmy Van Heusen and Johnny Burke from 1943, a song that was introduced by Dorothy L'Amour in the Paramount musical comedy And the Angels Sing. An ambiguous start to this song, but if you know the melody, it will emerge to you after about 15 seconds with interesting reharmonization from Valera, who gets the first exciting solo. Let's hear the tune get going.
Thomas's solo on this tune has long connected phrases and is really swinging. Let's pick it up midway to the end. Back to the melody there, and some final sax flutters at the end to finish the album. Now, unless you want to become severely flustered, I recommend you don't listen to this recording the way I did yesterday and today, <laughs> trying to figure out everything that's going on. Just enjoy it, because it's all very musical and interesting. In a sense, I feel that Thomas's compositions are problems or mazes that he develops to navigate and solve with interesting journeys of improvisations. I like that approach. There are other composer musicians, such as Tom Harrell, who I get a similar sense from in his compositions. Thomas has impressive technique and a wide range of tonal possibilities to express whatever emotion is on deck from tender to angsty. His solos are intense, creative, and find interesting paths through the often complex harmonies here. Valera seems an ideal match, sounding really smooth no matter the tempo or meter, and always imaginative in his solos. And Brewer brings a lot of variety and approach on both acoustic and electric bass styles with really nice solos too. And Calvert is exciting. He can do some really heavy hitting that we hear throughout the album. The music here is searching and challenging, but always very musical, and I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I did not listen to this album the way you did. I just kind of like, let it <laughs> flow over me. And the funny thing is, I picked up sort of a... Thought it was, first of all, I thought it was really appealing, the, the sax mm -hmm. solos especially. But they also kind of hit me on an intellectual level as well. And because of those rhythms, that probably is what did it. And I didn't really know what it was. And I was having trouble articulating it. Right. You know, what I liked about this album and this, uh, you know, conclusion. I wasn't catching how Thomas, you know, got the effects that were making me sit up and listen, these little turns mm -hmm. of phrase or occasionally he would do. But I suspect it had something to do with the way he kind of locked in with the changing meters and things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. I thought this was an exciting and engaging album. There's a lot more in it than I picked up when I listened to it, for sure. Like, you know, just listening to you talk about it kind of gave me that idea. I'm sure it's going to repay repeated listenings and not just for me, for all listeners. Yeah. Also, the drum solo on track five, I don't know if you, I didn't hear you talk about this, but uh, Shades of Green, uh, mm -hmm. maybe the most exciting drum solo we've heard since the beginning of the podcast. It really just moved. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. I have it's to really go back amazing. and to it again. Yeah, geez, it just took me out of my seat. I was like, whoa, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is a captivating album. It really surprised me, and this was probably my favorite jazz release of the week. Oh, cool. Yeah, in fact, I want to say I'm going to have to go back to like episode 12, and I don't remember that record. I'm going to have to hear <laughs> hear that again. Well, we've only listened to like 800 and some recording since yeah, then. Yeah, I think the 800 <laughs> albums we heard in between just sort of uh, erased it from my memory. There, I have to go back. We'll be over a thousand by summertime. So, wow, there you go. <laughs> And that's why we need a week off next week. So. <laughs> Minus six. <laughs> yeah. We can go outdoors <laughs> and breathe. Yeah. Yeah, so don't forget we'll be back with a, another episode on March 25th. Do you have any preview for what's coming up then? We've already got it picked out. I'm going for, I guess we're both going for an off-the-beaten-path kind of uh, idea. I've got two very you know minor labels coming mm -hmm. up, and uh, it's all chamber music. One of them is... um. The harp composer, Prate, who we heard mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. Was it last year? I don't remember when, but 2022 maybe. Okay. Yeah, so it wasn't last year. It was two years ago. We heard a concerto by Prate, and now we're going to hear two chamber works. This is the one that Daniel gave us a heads up about, right? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Daniel Bernardson, Ranitsky Project. Yeah. yeah. And he also says we've got more Ranitsky to look forward to, maybe in the fall, so... 
That's right. Yeah, I'm looking, looking forward, forward to, to that, that as too. well. Let's see, I've got more chamber. I've got some um, chanson, violin, piano, and string quartet uh, concerto. Mm-hmm. It's called a concert piece. And uh, Guillaume Lecou, a composer who, like Lily Boulanger, died really young. He, he was only 24 and was a oh. promising composer. And the few works he left behind are really fantastic. So I'm going to introduce that. I think we may have heard something by him on the podcast right. before. And then I've got a new Hyperion release of Korngold and Tchaikovsky string six tets and works that are, you know, especially the Tchaikovsky, it's a fairly well-known work, but we rarely hear it, hear it recorded these days. And we're going to get a new recording of that. Cool. On the jazz side, I've got kind of a trumpet connection. We're going to listen to a French trumpeter, Julian Bertrand, and his group New Fly with a record called Waxman. And I had picked this as one of my daily picks on a Friday, probably, because I shared it on Facebook. I didn't tag him or anything. I just put it up there for our listeners. But he noticed that I had shared it, and he thanked me. And so I thought, oh, that was very nice. And so I thought, well, include that in a full episode. We've also got Chris Rottmeyer's Being this on Shifting Paradigm Records. And this is a exploration of the music of Mulgrew Miller and Woody Shaw from their work together. And so I was interested to hear something from or inspired by Woody Shaw's music. And connecting to that Woody Shaw connection, we're going to listen to Daggerboard group with their new recording, Escapement. That's on Wide Hive Records. Hmm. And this is from trumpeter Eric Jacobson, who was on Jason Kaiser's Woody Shaw music recording. So a few connections of ideas there. And Eric follows us on Facebook now, so I think he'll be happy if we talk about that recording. It's got a lot of really interesting and intricate arranging on it, and so that'll be something to jump into. I might need to get some help about what's going on, so I might write to him and find out. So that's all all coming up in two weeks from now. We want to say, as always, thanks to Fast Signs of Staten Island for our glowing neon logo and sometimes CD delivery service. Don't forget to check out the same difference to jazz fans. One jazz standard podcast, AJ and Johnny, their little promo will be following our sign off here. Any last words until two weeks, Mike? Yeah, two weeks. Well, you know what? I'm going to have a request to our listeners. Now, for the last three years since we started the podcast, Russ and I have this sort of, oh, little friendly bet going where if there are more jazz emails than classical emails at the end of the year, you know, he gets a free bottle of booze. <laughs> and I want to win that one this year. So classical <laughs> listeners, please uh, write into us, okay? Because we yeah. don't hear enough from you. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. So help, help me win this. <laughs> let me get something in my liquor cabinet here. <laughs> Mine is running out of space, so Mike needs it more than I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so write into us, classical music artists and listeners and producers and record label people. All right. So this has been episode 156, Sax Partners. And we'll be back with some more interesting new music in two weeks for episode 157. Until then, keep listening and we'll see you next time. Same difference. Two jazz fans, one jazz standard. A review of a single jazz standard through music, history, and stories. And this is AJ. And this is Johnny. If you are a jazz fan and you like jazz standards, bebop, show tunes, ballads, you name it. Yeah, we've got them here. We drop a new show on you every other week, and we take a standard, and we listen to a few different versions of it. Same difference. Come join the fun. Looking forward to seeing you.